Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for Digital Discovery Day. My name is Caroline Katsurubis. I'm Freight Farms Director of Marketing and Community Relations, and I'll be guiding today's event with some of my colleagues who will introduce themselves in just a couple minutes. All right, let's talk about what Digital Discovery Day is. We have designed this event to cover all the things that you need and want to know about freight farms before you purchase our container farming system. So first, you will get a better look into the freight farms technology during our Greenery S farm tour with Derek. And then you are going to hear from our freight farmer, Mario Vitalis, who founded his container farming business, New Age Provisions Farms in Indianapolis, almost two years ago, which is it's super exciting. Can't wait to hear about all the growth that has happened in his business. And then for those of you who are, who are turning tuning in live to this event, we are going to be randomly selecting five lucky winners um, who will receive a free copy of Mario's new book that he wrote called Shipping Container Farming, um, which we'll talk more about in his session. So uh, something to look forward to. We'll contact the winners um, after today is over. And then after his session, we are going to be diving into how you start and build a container farming business, reviewing different sales channels, going through example income statements, and then um, also talking about how to effectively build uh, a brand around your farm and uh, a variety of different marketing strategies that you can um, try out. And then last, but certainly not least, what happens after you purchase a container farm? Um, there, there are a lot of questions that we get all the time, like what happens um, so we will cover the entire after purchase journey um, we'll talk about the variety of different training options that we offer how we actually get your container farm to you you can see in this picture like we are pros at moving these things um, and then also all the ongoing support and resources that we provide because once you start we're not just leaving you high and dry there are a lot of different things um, that that we provide to make sure that you are up and running successfully. So I'm trying not to get distracted seeing how, uh, where everyone is tuning in from, but we have such a global audience today. Um, so I, you know, variety of different projects that you wanna get started. Um, and I just really wanna urge you to take advantage of this event. We are all here to answer your questions and make sure that you feel confident going into this journey and starting a container farming operation. So definitely utilize the Q&A feature on your Zoom panel. Um, there will be a question and answer session at the end of each of our um, event categories. And if you miss anything, don't worry, it's recorded. We'll send it out to you um, in a day or two. All right. Enough from me. I'm going to pass uh, the mic to the team to introduce themselves and which session they are going to be leading. Perfect. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Derek Baker. I'm a lead industrial designer here at Freight Farms. I will be providing the Greenery S tour for you, giving out you an inside look at all the different piece, pieces, parts, and components and how they work together to ensure that we're creating that perfect environment for our plants to thrive 365 days a year. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is DeMario Vitalis. I look forward to speaking to you in my session about my history of being a freight farmer and how I got and became a freight farmer today. Um, I look forward to speaking with you. I'm on mute. Oops, sorry. I'm JC. I'm our growth marketing manager here at Freight Farms. Really excited to talk with you about um, how to build and market your business, your farm business, so that you can be as successful as possible. Hi, everyone. I'm Brooke. I'm an account executive here at Freight Farms. I'll be in the session with JC talking about how we craft a successful business model and create a hyperlocal farming business in your own community. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel. I'm an account executive on the business development team, and I will be uh, leading the after purchase journey with Mark. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Mark. I'm the community and customer success manager uh, and I will be talking with Rachel about the after purchase journey. 
Awesome. Well, it's very excited for you all to get uh, inside look at all these different parts of Freight Farms and how they all work together to really make this product and experience, um, you know, really cultivated for you. Um, but let's get right into it. I'm too excited to, to slow down here. Let's get right into the tour. Um, essentially, what you're looking at, what I'm standing in here is, is the Green Mess is the world's most productive hydroponic farm. Uh, in its essence, it's an atmospherically controlled, tech-connected hydroponic farm, all built out in a 40-foot insulated shipping container. So atmospherically controlled, we're utilizing uh, different components to control the air, humidity, uh, CO2, our water conditions, our lighting environment, and everything in between. Tech Connected, we have our powerful farmhand software that allows you to remotely control, monitor, and view your farm uh, for anywhere in the world, any day of the year. Hydroponic, we're utilizing a nutrient-rich water solution rather than soil to feed our plants. And we'll talk about how we utilize that in a couple different ways in the farm here. And lastly, this 40-foot shipping container. Why do we use the shipping container? Um, I think we, we mentioned it, but it's really easy to get these things anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter where you are. We will get this container to you. You can drop it down, plug it into water, power, and you're practically ready to grow. Um, but let's get into a little bit of the nitty gritty. So the Greenery S is comprised of essentially two growing areas. We have first what we call our nursery station, which is the stainless steel workstation that I'm standing out. This is where all your plants will be will start, where you'll seed them, they'll grow to uh, seedlings for a couple of weeks, and then they'll be transplanted into our cultivation area. So that's the second area that we're growing in the farm. And that's where your seedlings will be transplanted and grow to maturity, where then they'll be harvested um, and that cycle will continue on. Let's start with this nursery station though, and give you a bit of an overview of what you're looking at here. Let's see if we can give you a, a little better angle. All right, so essentially, this is a stainless steel workstation for all of your processes, whether it be seeding, transplanting, harvesting, et cetera. Uh, below that, we have two independently controlled and automatically irrigated ebb and flow troughs. So I'll talk about what that ebb and flow nature uh, is. On the left side here, we have our nursery tank. So that's housing all the water that's going to be feeding our plants in the nursery station. And on the right side, very similar form factor, but we have what we call our dosing cabinet. Now this is monitoring and controlling the nutrient content in our water in our two different zones. We'll talk about it more, but we have a water zone for our nursery station and a water zone for our cultivation area as uh, plants within these different parts of the growth stage have different nutrient needs. Um, and again, we'll get into the nitty gritty of that in a minute here. So just sort of starting with the process, um, everything kind of starts with water. Uh, so in this, excuse me, slide it over here. In this 40 gallon nursery tank, it is outfitted with a sensor that is a pressure sensor. It's gonna be reading the pressure uh, of the water on that sensor and telling you the volume of that tank. That volume is going to be compared to a set point in our farmhand software, which is going to automatically activate an electronically controlled ball valve in the rear of the farm. So we have all of our electrical, water, um, and HVAC is mounted on the exterior rear of the container. So we'll have a spigot back there for you to either hard plumb into, or you can set up an IBC tote or something like that to feed your tanks. But essentially that sensor is gonna talk to that ball valve through farmhand and open, that, open it when the, the volume of the tank drops below your set point. That water is now going to flow into this tank, filling it up to the proper volume. Now we need to add nutrients to this uh, raw water. Essentially what happens is that that water is going to be constantly pumped through the table into our, let's get over here, see if we can take a look at it, into our dosing cabinet, which is going to be monitoring a few things and tough angle here, but we'll get you guys in there. Basically, you'll see here, we have these two sensors and we've got two of them, one for the nursery zone, one for the cultivation zone. Essentially, these sensors are reading the pH, the EC, which stands for electroconnectivity or the salinity salt content of the water. And that's gonna tell us the density of nutrients in it as well um, as we're measuring the temperature. Now we have a series of nutrient tanks here. These are about four quart tanks that are gonna house liquid nutrients. The settings 
for your specific recipe in farming, excuse me, sliding this over here, are going to tell the system basically what nutrient to dispense into the water based on those settings. And how that works is that we have these parasaltic pumps that are um, paired, essentially, they pull from the nutrient tanks. So they'll pull utilizing um, this dilation method that's a really precise form of uh, dispensing. It'll dispense a certain amount of nutrient into this manifold, which is our recirculation line. Water is being pumped from that tank through this manifold. Nutrients are being added. That water then is going to return to our nursery tank where it will be mixed up to create this uniform nutrient uh, slurry or plant smoothie, as I like to say. Now we're ready to feed the plants with this plant smoothie. And this happens through a delivery method called ebb and flow. So again, we're utilizing hydroponics, which means we're using that nutrient-rich water solution to feed our plants. So we're gonna deliver that nutrient-rich water directly to the roots of the plants, uh, really creating a scenario that the foliage is able to intact its natural oils and all of the benefits uh, without having to implement pesticides and other things because we have no pests in here. Um, as again, we're just utilizing water and nutrients. So what's gonna happen periodically and automatically, that water is gonna be pumped from our tank into one or both of these independently controlled ebb and flow troughs. The water is going to flood the area below these trays, basically allowing these peat moss plugs, which are essentially nature's sponge, to absorb that water, giving its roots access to all that nice nutrient rich water, that plant smoothie, any water that's not absorbed by these plants is going to then drain back into a collection tank that's gonna pump it back into our nursery tank. And this system will recycle that water and irrigate it uh, about every eight hours, again, automatically. So that is essentially the water uh, aspect of our nursery station, how we're delivering that nutrient rich water solution. The next important recipe to uh, dive into here is the lighting recipe and how light affects these plants. So within the nursery station here, we have, again, by utilizing farmhand, let me flip on some of our lights here. All right, so we have both a red and a blue lighting spectrum that we utilize in our nursery tank or nursery uh, station. And I was just showing the, the blue and the red isolated, but we also have, of course, the ability to run them simultaneously, which creates this sort of magenta look. But let me just give you both the blue and the red. Specifically, these wavelengths, sorry, these gloves are. All right. So in each of these, above each of these independently controlled irrigated troughs, we have these alighting arrays. These are outfitted with red and blue diodes. Those diodes are producing a light that is on this lighting spectrum, 660 nanometers for our red, 440 nanometers for our blue. And these are specific wavelengths of light that have been proven to initiate photosynthesis. So we're not utilizing uh, a white light as that would create a scenario in which uh, essentially you're gonna be paying for light and energy that isn't actually being absorbed by the plants. So we isolate this red and the blue, and then the combination of which to really pull out the best characteristics of photosynthesis, as the red light will promote a, uh, and activate a hormone in the plants that basically initiates the growth or more rapid growth of stem and leaf. Uh, so the foliage of the plant itself, that's why we're getting such big, um, healthy foliage. And then the blue light is actually going to initiate a different hormone that's going to activate growth of root and stem more uh, creating a more substantial root system. So this combination creates a scenario in which we have a really strong root system. You can see those beautiful white roots on that curling around the plug, as we like to see, and also very strong, robust leaves. And this makes them super resilient so that they're ready to be transplanted into the cultivation area. And I gleaned over it, but uh, really quickly, in this nursery station, we have eight of these tray inserts per trough. So we have a total of 16 tray ins inserts uh, per trough, equating to a total of about 4,600 plant sites in the nursery station alone 
if you're utilizing a 288 cell tray. Now this station has been designed to accommodate any agricultural 1020 tray and 1020 is just referring to basically the dimensionality of the tray. So you can utilize a 200 cell tray, 288 cell, a flat tray if you're looking to grow microgreens um, and a variety of other options depending on what you're looking to grow. The 200 and 288 cell trays are a bit more standard for people who are growing our, our most popular crops such as different lettuces and herbs. Now, all of these 4,600 plant sites are gonna be more than enough to continually fill your cultivation area, meaning you might have extra sites that you can uh, dedicate to microgreen production, extra seedling production. Um, essentially, we wanna make sure you never run out of seedlings because they are the fuel that powers your farm. So let's get into the cultivation area a bit. What's gonna happen in the nursery area is that after you plant your seedlings and they germinate, usually takes you know three to seven days, depending on the crop type, to spend another one to two weeks in here developing that strong root and stem. Then they'll be ready to transplant into the cultivation area. And that can happen in a couple of ways. You could quite literally come over here and transplant them directly into the panels. Or if you're looking for a bit more ergonomic scenario, all of these plant panels are removable, can be placed on your nursery station and all of your operations can happen here. Before we get too far into this, let me give you a quick overview of what the cultivation area is comprised of. Essentially what you're looking at here Let's get you a little closer. I'm sorry for all the movement, I'm trying to give you guys the best view possible. What you're looking at here is we have two, all right, let's try this, two grow rows. Each of these grow rows, one here, one over here, are outfitted with 44 plant panels. So 22 per side, they sit back to back. That creates 88 of our plant panels. Each of these plant panels have five growing channels, and this results in over 8,800 plant sites potential uh, in this cultivation area. On either side of our plant rows, our plant panel rows, we have LED arrays. So you'll see on the wall here, we have an LED array that's also outfitted with a fabric duct, which is going to disperse CO2 uh, enriched air over the canopy itself. You'll see we have one of these on either side of the farm. And then in between, we have what we call our mobile LED wall, which is a double-sided LED wall outfitted with those same LEDs, but on both sides uh, pointed towards our, our plant panels, of course. Now in the rear of the farm, we have a three-ton uh, HVAC unit that's gonna do a combination of cooling, heating, and dehumidification. We'll talk more about that as, uh, in a little bit. But like I said, after a couple of weeks, those seedlings will be transplanted into these plant panels. And let's talk about these plant panels a bit too. These have been developed specifically by Freight Farms for the Greenery and Greenery S um, and designed in a way that allows you to really, really customize your growing experience. So we have all of these growing channels. We've got channel one, two, three, four, five. Each of these channels is outfitted with a few different components. We have this reticulated foam which is this black sort of porous foam. This acts as our, our earth in the sense that it's our structural housing for our plants. It's literally holding these in place. In between that, we have what we call a saturation strip. This is a very high wicking strip that is going to collect our nutrient-rich water solution and allow each plant to get that, that nutrient-rich water solution at equal ratios, um, ensuring that each plant has everything it needs. All of this is housed in this high impact polystyrene sort of shell. This is a really rigid, really uh, strong, lightweight shell that each panel is made out of. Now you might see this right now and say, okay, well, I see that there's five growing channels, but there's only plants planted in the one, three, and five channels. Now, why is that? Now, again, we've customized this for different crop types. So with this, with this panel itself, we're growing a bib head lettuce, which is uh, a lettuce that will grow to a certain head size. And we want to make sure we have enough room for that lettuce to grow to its max size, but really maximize the space. So we do that by planting in these one, three, and five channels, where channels two and four 
are, are basically our negative space that our plants are going to grow into and fill up eventually. And I can walk down the aisle here in a minute and show you what that looks like later on in the growth stage. There are scenarios in which you would use all five of these channels. So for more high density crops, such as uh, basil, arugula, chives, cilantro, really any of your herbs, you will be able to utilize all five of these growing channels and plant in a really high density uh, planting pattern to really maximize this space. Lastly, another form of planting that you can utilize on this five channel design is what we call intercropping. So this is actually a great potential for you to maximize your uh, yields by planting a root vegetable intermixed with something like a head of lettuce. So the way that that would work is that you're actually going to utilize the negative space between these heads of lettuce in channels two and four to plant something such as a turnip, a radish, a carrot, anything like that. Uh, there's different ways to plant in these plant panels to maximize your yields. We want to went over some of those different planting arrays. All that information is online as well, but essentially um, this five channel panel gives you the ability to grow a variety of different crops and really maximize the space on, on this panel. Uh, and I wanted to transition to the cultivation area, just like the nursery station. I want to start with sort of the water and how we utilize that hydroponic nutrient rich water solution. Uh, similarly to the way that we do in the nursery station, the difference here is how we deliver it to the plants. So you'll see, obviously, the form factor here is much different. We're growing in a vertical scenario rather than in these trays uh, in the nursery station. So that alone requires a different way to deliver that water. But starting at the source, in the rear of the farm, we have a 100-gallon cultivation vein tank that is housed with the same uh, pressure sensor as our nursery tank and speaks to that electronic ball valve in the same way through farmhand to have it open that ball valve and have water auto fill that tank to the certain and specified volume. Once that tank is full, it will pump water up to this same dosing cabinet, but through a different, through the second set of sensors, which will read those settings and compare them to the set point in farmhand. And you'll hear me saying this a lot, comparing it to the set point in farmhand. And, and I uh, essentially, we have different recipes within farmhand that are pre-programmed that depending on the crop you're growing, the farm will know the settings it needs to set to. So these are not settings that you need to know, okay, a uh, head of lettuce needs 5.6 pH and 1600 uh, EC. The farm will know that from the start. Once you get more experience with growing, you'll have an understanding of how you might want to tweak some of these settings for different crops and different experimental vegetables. Um, but essentially for that canon of of uh, leafy greens, herbs. We have all that information filled out for you. So if you hear me reference to that, that's not something you need to know, the farm will know that for you. So that's gonna address that, um, excuse me, that is going to talk to farmhand, compare that water readings to the readings in farmhand and dispense the proper liquid nutrient from that same tank, but into our cultivation return line, which is gonna then send that nutrient rich water solution all the way back to the cultivation tank which is then going to mix it thoroughly, creating that nutrient-rich water solution or that nutrient smoothie for our plants. And now we're ready to get it to the plants. How we do that is we actually pump it from that tank up the rear of these grow frames to the very top where there is a irrigation line. See if you can see it here. That gray pipe here. Now, in that irrigation line, we have all of these pressure regulated drip emitters. Each of these emitter, emitters has a diaphragm in it that is regulating the amount of water flowing out of them at uh, two gallons per hour. And those are located above all of our channels in our plant panels. That water will drip into the plant panel, saturate that wicking or saturation strip, which I showed you in, uh, earlier that will allow equal access and saturation to that water along the entire length of our seven foot plant panel. Any water that's not absorbed by these plants or subsequently transpired uh, into the air will be collected in these gutters below, which are sloped back to the tank, sending it back to the tank to be, uh, to have the settings of the, or the, uh, the nutrient conditions monitored once more, nutrients added, and then recycled up back to the plants. And this closed loop system is one of the reasons that we're able to utilize such a, a small amount of water uh, daily, anywhere between five to 10 gallons or even less, depending on your humidity. 
as we are reclaiming that water and actually putting it back into our tank. So this form of nutrient delivery, or excuse me, hydroponic delivery is called a vertical drip system. And it stays true to its name as we're literally dripping this water into a vertical panel and allowing it to utilize gravity to fall down and feed all of our plants. Now the lighting in the cultivation area is of course equally as important as it is in the nursery station. And I mentioned before, we have these lighting arrays located on either side of our growing rows. These LED boards, we have 114 of them, resulting in over 50,000 diodes that are fueling our plants. Each of these diodes, we have a combination of, might be hard to see here, but you can kind of see red and blue. Again, utilizing that 660 nanometer light on the red spectrum and 440 nanometer light for the blue spectrum to feed our plants. Now we spoke about the different um, colors and spectrums of light and why we use those. But something that we have uh, implemented in the greenery S for the first time and freight farms that we're really excited about is the intensity of the light and being able to control that utilizing three dynamic lighting modes. We have eco mode, we have standard mode, and we have performance mode. And this is for you to have the ability to not only control the rate of growth of your plant, but also have complete visibility and control over your energy consumption for your farm so that you can utilize you know, renewable energy um, or just lower that electrical bill, depending on uh, the way that you're growing it and your, your different clients and how you want to deliver produce to them. So essentially what we're doing with these three power modes is we're providing a different level of PPFD. And PPFD is just how we measure light intensity in a growing environment. Essentially compared to something like lumens, which most people are familiar with, which will tell you the actual output of a light bulb uh, when you're going to buy a new light bulb for your house. You know, you see hundred lumens, 50 lumens, whatever it might be, that's telling you how bright, how much light is actually being produced by that bulb. What PPFD is gonna tell us is, th is not how much light is being produced, but how much light is actually reaching our canopy, reaching our plants. And that's what we really care about because that light loss or potential light loss um, is, is it, you know, we don't care about how much is actually being produced, but how much the plants are absorbing. Now in the forum, we have developed the three modes at three specific PPFDs. Uh, and really quickly, let me just break down what PPFD means. It's photosynthetic, photon flux density, mouthful, a lot of crazy words, but really what it means, photosynthetic, that's light that is uh, utilized in photosynthesis. Uh, photon, it's a unit of light. Flux density, basically just saying how much light is actually flowing over that surface at a given time. So within the cultivation area of the greenery S, we have the ability to fine tune that PPFD to a range. In our eco mode, we're right around 180 to 200 and or so PPFD. Standard mode, 220 to 250. Uh, performance mode, 280 to 300. And we max out right around 300 and, and it'll go over a little bit as you move your, your panels closer or further from your plants to as again, the PPFD is dependent on that distance. Uh, so those measurements are based on this farm in its home setting. So with everything evenly spaced out. And we've specifically chosen those levels of the PPFD because there is a direct relationship between the rate of growth of a plant and the amount of light that it's receiving. So essentially, if you double the amount of light, you're going to double the rate of growth, the rate of photosynthesis. Now, this is obviously incredibly beneficial. So why not just keep hitting these plants with more and more light? Well, that relationship is true and linear up to a certain point. Right around 300 PPFD, that relationship begins to plateau. So you can continue to add more light and your plant's photosynthetic rate will not increase. So anything above that 300 to 350 PPFD mark is just wasted energy. So our performance mode really hones in on that line right before it begins to plateau. So you're really maximizing the energy and the kilowatt hours that are coming into your farm and turning that into viable consumable products. So that is the lighting environment. And I know that was probably a lot to digest there. We've got a lot of great uh, information online for you to look into as well, if you have any more questions about that. Uh, but just wanted to bring home the point that these LEDs panels and this lighting environment has been specifically fine-tuned for the greenery S. And let me just give you a peek of what it actually looks like as we develop 
see if we can capture these lighting modes on the video here. So you'll see that was our standard to performance, or excuse me, that was eco to standard. And that was hard to see there, but that was standard to performance. And of course we have the ability to isolate red and blue, just like we do in the nursery station as those lights, as I mentioned before, pull out different char characteristics of the plants. So depending on what you're growing, again, you have this ability to fine tune your recipe in your farm to cultivate a crop to be exactly what you or potentially what your client is looking for. Now, the last thing to really hone in on here is, um, of course, we've covered lighting, we've covered water for both of our cultivation and nursery zones. Lastly, the atmosphere, the air conditions, of course, play a huge role as well. So we're utilizing a variety of, of things to create that perfect temperature, perfect humidity, and perfect CO2 level for our plants to thrive. We're utilizing the three ton HVAC unit that's going to be doing dehumidification at two gallons per hour. So depending on where you are and how much your plants are transpiring, how much humidity is in the air, we're able to recapture that at two gallons per hour and actually reclaim that back into our system. Uh, so again, really honing in on the ability to minimize water use. It, our HVAC unit also has two stages of cooling that's gonna be able to maintain uh, set points as low as 55 degrees in certain uh, climates. Of course, if you're in a warmer climate, uh, you might have a slightly higher set point depending. And it has a heater, of course, if you're in a really cold climate, in, such as Alaska or somewhere up in the Arctic, um, anywhere else, even here in Boston, we actually really don't utilize the heater as the lights provide an ambient warmth that is able to heat the farm to its set point as well. Now, what's really cool about the way that we deliver this air into the container or into the cultivation space is that we have redesigned this container specifically for the Greenery S. So we're utilizing airways within the floor of the container and the rear wall to deliver this air. So how it works is we have a false wall in the back that's acting as a duct. Our air is, is, is uh, blown into that duct. It's then redirected down into the floor and travels all the way down from the back of the container up to the front of the container here where it exits through this floor grate. Now the return air for this is pulled through a return grate that is located sort of at the top rear of the container. Now we distribute and separate the supply and the return to be on opposite sides of the farm for a very specific reason. This is going to give us a really uniform atmospheric environment. So by bringing in that cool, dry air to this side of the container and utilizing a series of fans and distribution uh, air methods, we're able to pull that, that perfect air condition through the farm, through our entire cultivation area, sort of filtering through our plants, where it then will slowly begin to heat be returned into the HVAC unit, cooled, and then replenished once more to this far end of the container. So utilizing that technique, we're able to create the most uniform atmospheric environment that we've ever had in a greenery. Now, the last piece of the, the atmospheric condition puzzle here is CO2. So of course, opposite to us, plants are breathing in CO2 and exhaling oxygen. So we need to provide supplementary CO2 to ensure that we're able to give them as much big breaths of air as possible. So we do this utilizing uh, CO2 canisters and we have a dedicated space to the left of our nursery tank here where we have our CO2 canister. This is just a 20 pound CO2 canister that will last a couple growth cycles. And that is connected to a tube, which is gonna feed up all the way back. And it actually runs to the ductage fans which are connected to these fabric ducts. Now these fabric ducts have a series of holes located in them that are going to provide about 100 feet per minute of airflow over the canopy. And that CO2 enriched air is going to be fed into that and then dispersed evenly and uniformly throughout your cultivation zone. Now, I think that sort of touches on all of the different aspects of the farm. Of course, I usually do not leave enough time for questions, but I'm hoping we do have some time because I'm sure there are plenty of them. 
fortunately, you are very thorough, uh, so, but we do have a lot of questions. Um, thank you so much, Derek, for for that tour. Let's for for people who are less familiar with freight farms and our our technology that may have been a tad overwhelming because it's a very sophisticated system with multiple parts. So if you could spend a minute or so talking about maybe a software that uh, we have that kind of takes the, the heavy lifting out of running the farm. Absolutely. Let's see if I can. How visible are we here? Let me try this. Decently visible. Great. All right. So what you're looking at here is our farmhand software. So this is the hub in which you will be able to remotely monitor, control, and analyze your grow. And this is uh, to make things as easy as possible for you because, you know, as it was probably clear, of course, there's a lot of technical parts of this farm. Uh, and I want you to know how they all work together, but you don't actually need to know any of that when you start. I mean, this is things that you'll learn um, and knowing it up front is a benefit, sure. But we've built all this functionality into this app so that you can come in, no green thumb, no prior experience growing a plant. Maybe you don't even know what a LED is, what hydroponics are, it does not matter. This software will help you get started. Uh, and it does that in a variety of ways. So just giving you a Reef tour here. Oh, I am on my keyboard, which is creating a double click. Here we go. Uh, let's see, I gotta back that up so I'm not on the keyboard. Caroline, are you still able to see uh, the screen well enough here? Yes. Okay, great. So this dashboard is going to give you an overview of basically your farm in a nutshell. Uh, what you're looking at here is we have a sensor, and this is great because it's going to bring up things I forgot to mention. In our nutrient tanks, now these are these tanks that are located in our dosing cabinet, those uh, tubes that were coming out the top there, those four quart tanks. Those have a sensor in it that's essentially your low tank um, similar sensor, similar to what you have in your gas tank in your car. It's gonna say, hey, you should probably refill soon. Um, so right now it's telling us our nutrient levels are good to go. We don't need to worry about that. Similarly, we have sensors that will tell these pumps to turn off in the uh, nursery station. Uh, and these top trough and bottom trough levels there are saying, basically your, your nursery station is not running. You don't need to worry about it right now. We have a quick glance at the volume of our tanks. Uh, we have quick snapshots at the, the different plants growing in our farm. We have a series of cameras, again, something I forgot to mention, embedded throughout the farm. So within our nursery station, you can see here, we have, in, cameras embedded in the lighting panels that are looking directly down at your, um, at your plants. So you can get a glimpse of how those are doing, how are your plants germinating, how are your seedlings progressing with a quick snapshot without having to come to the farm. Similarly, in the cultivation area, we have quick snapshots of different areas of your farm that give you an idea of how your growth is going. Also, all of the readings that you need to worry about, the container conditions, meaning the atmospheric conditions. We have 65 degrees in here, 62% humidity, 924 parts per million of CO2. Those numbers mean nothing to you at the moment, I'm sure, but essentially uh, they're green, they're good. Farmhand is saying we are good to go. Uh, similarly with the water conditions in our nursery and cultivation area, we have 64 degree and 66 degree water, 5.8 uh, pH, six in the cultivation, uh, and you'll see 2000 versus 1500 EC. And again, this is why we distribute or separate those, those two water zones because the seedlings and cultivation plants have different needs. But this gives you a really quick glimpse of how your farm's doing, um, and, but that's not all. You have the ability to control every part of the farm. So as you've probably seen me here, I've been popping things on and off with these little toggle switches. So if you leave your farm and it's like, oh shoot, I forgot to turn the, the lights back on because I turned them off when I entered, you can do that from anywhere in the world just with a flick of a switch here. We also have prompts for different things like calibration and cleaning. Uh, this is a part of the process I didn't quite talk about, but of course there's a maintenance schedule you want to follow, uh, you know, bi-weekly um, or once a month where you want to clean your tanks, clean your plant panels between um, harvests, et cetera, calibrate your sens sensors. We have prompts that will walk you through all of those things really easily. 
We also have the recipe page. Now you heard me mentioning this before. This is a lettuce recipe that we're running right now in performance mode. So by selecting the recipe, it's actually going to determine all of the different set points for your nursery and cultivation areas. So again, just kind of taking the thought process out of it. We've done all the legwork for you here. We know exactly what these plants need to thrive and we pre-programmed that into the software. Of course, we have sort of our canon of recipes here and, and maybe as you become more of an expert grower, you're gonna to wanna to expand on that recipe because you've learned, oh, I'm growing a sorrel that really likes a pH of 5.2 and EC a little higher than my flower or herb recipe. You can create that recipe for yourself, save it and always go back to it, tweak it as you begin to fine tune your grow and understand different ways that you're boosting yield or potentially increasing flavor, color, all of these things. Now I could keep going, but I'm sure I'm already starting to get too deep into even this. But essentially what I want you to know is that we have a resource that will basically help you identify, learn and monitor everything in the farm. Awesome. Thank you, Derek. Yeah, for, for everyone um, new to farmhand, it is such an incredible and robust uh, ecosystem that not only remotely monitors, connects, and runs your farm, but it also enables you to connect to multiple other resources from freight farms, from our digital knowledge base, um, to our community forum and platform, to our shop where you can buy all of your, your refillable needs. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that in the last session as well. Um, but I do want to touch really quickly about training because uh, a, a few people have asked about training. We have a variety of different training options for you. Um, a digital version that's accessible at any time when you purchase Farmhand uh, is called Farmhand Academy. It's a variety of um, uh, videos and quizzes that really take you through every single part of running the farm. Then we have an in-person farm camp at our HQ in Boston. Um, that's a two-day uh, in-person training, a variety of different farm sessions and in-classroom sessions. And then we also offer an on-site launch and training visit. And we will go through all of those options again um, in the session with Mark and Rachel at the end um, of this event. Really quickly, that software, um, people were asking if it's included. This software has a recurring cost of $2,400 per year. And if you really want to take a, a deep dive into Farmhand and the value that it provides, definitely check out um, our website. You can even schedule a more in-depth um, demo with your account executive as well. Okay, let's knock off a couple more of these questions, Derek. There are a lot of questions about maintenance um, and what it looks like with the entire system. Could you just give me a, a brief snapshot and maybe just say like, people are wondering about things breaking down. What are the things that most commonly break down? Um, yeah, so there are definitely some more consumable aspects of the farm. Uh, first, I'll just talk about like what those consumables are. So the things that you will be needing to buy on a regular basis uh, through our farmhand shop. That's again, as Caroline said, linked right to our farmhand app. Um, or you know, hydroponics is really popular nowadays. You can get these these nutrients wherever you want. It's really up to you. Um, but we have liquid nutrients that you will need to buy periodically to fill your your nutrient tanks. The plugs that we plant all of our seeds in, those are consumable as well as they get. Uh, either um, thrown away or compost at the end of each grow cycle. Seeds, of course, do not reuse seeds as much as that would be awesome. Um, uh, so those are like primarily the things that you'll need to buy on a regular basis. Uh, it's not because they break down, but it's just because they are quite consumable. From a sort of operation standpoint, things that could potentially fail, um, there are instances where if you do not adhere to proper maintenance schedule and specifically thinking about cleaning your tanks, um, there's a, there is a chance that you could have a buildup of uh, nutrients if you're not careful where, you know, there's calcium in the nutrients, which could calcify. Um, and if that happens on a pump per se, and there's a large amount of algae and it restricts the, the flow of that pump, that could choke out that pump, which could result in a propeller failure and that pump would be essentially uh, useless until it needs to be replaced. But that will only really happen um, in a condition in which uh, you're not maintaining your farm 
I mean, if it does outside of that, of course, everything is warranted in this farm uh, based on the, the product of who we get it from. So we will adhere to that warranty and the, and the farm as a whole has a one year warranty as well. So if, if something happens and of course it, it happened for no reason, that part will be replaced by us. Um, but I would say the pumps are the first thing that come to mind. And again, if you don't adhere to a proper maintenance schedule, that's when you could see uh, a higher failure rate. Uh, besides that, there's little things again, and it all kind of comes back to this maintenance schedule. Your drip emitters may clog if that water is not turned over uh, once a month or so. And again, just to remove any extra calcium or nutrient buildup, any algae buildup that could find its way into the irrigation system and end up clogging one of these emitters that they do have a, a very small hole in the diaphragm that is controlling that water flow. Uh, but we have a series of, of, of uh, filters in our recirculation lines constantly filtering the water as well as the pumps have these sort of uh, boom mic looking filters on them as well uh, that do provide a bit of, of security from that. But if you don't clean, you may have failure. And let's stop on water for a second. Um, wh what about uh, people who may have hard, wa hard water situations? Uh, is there some sort of filter that we would want to um, add on to make sure that we are filtering out anything bad? Yeah, things? absolutely. So the first thing you're going to want to do when you know your farm's coming, well, not the first thing, but one of the things is to test your water to make sure, you know, see if it's hard or soft and have the corresponding uh, filtration system in place. Now you can see here we're running a carbon and micron filter to uh, filter our water as it comes into the farm. It's really loud back here, so I'm going to uh, move away from that. Uh, but essentially, that is taking the water straight from the autofill line and um, pulling any of that that uh, the hardness out of it, utilizing the RO filter. Um, and, and making sure that we have the, the correct hardness of water going into our tank so that we can, you know, add those nutrients and have confidence in that water solution. We have inputs directly on our, in our tank that will allow you to hook into to um, have that, that filtration system installed. That will be up to you to determine if you need that. Um, but we're happy to help you walk through that process and make sure that you are able to identify the proper components for your specific situation. Yeah, definitely. Don't worry. We will handle all of these um, kind of prompts during your onboarding process and make sure that you're checking all the necessary boxes before you get started. Okay, we are definitely over on time, but I have seen like 10 questions about generators. Um, if generators are necessary, uh, what happens in the event of some sort of power outage uh, the generator is as necessary as you think it is, honestly, it's, that's the best answer I can provide. If you're in an area where your power grid is relatively unstable, I would absolutely suggest having a generator um, as a backup. Uh, we can provide you what those specs would need to be. Um, if you were to experience a power outage without a generator, uh, you would want to get your power back up and running you know, as quickly as possible. Essentially, these plants can survive probably up to 48 to 60 hours or so without um, light and specifically water is the thing that they'll need most. You'll definitely see some wilting signs after 24 to 48 hours. Um, so you'll wanna get it up and running as quickly as possible, but you do have a, a, a small uh, a bit of time to, to try to get things back up and running. But again, just depending on your power grid. Great. Um, okay, I think we are going to stop there, Derek. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your questions. If we didn't get to your farm-specific questions, uh, we'll, your account executive will definitely handle those for you. Um, and then a lot of you were asking business and training-related questions, which we will definitely handle in uh, the next couple sessions. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Talk to you later. All right. Next up, we're going to be talking to Mario. And as long as we get his video on and potentially my video as well. There we go. Thank you, Amy. Hey, Mario. Hello, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for hanging in there uh, while we were running over. It's, it's very common. 
Uh, no problem. There's a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is. Awesome. Um, well, first off, thank you so much for for spending some time with us. Uh, this is one of the most popular sessions for Digital Discovery Day. As you know, you were once uh, in these folks' positions of just thinking about getting started. Um, so let's just start with an introduction to yourself and a little bit about your background. Okay, my name is DeMario Vitalis. I'm the owner and founder of New Age Provisions Farms. We're located in Indianapolis, Indiana. We're on the east side of Indianapolis off of 10th Street. Um, I've been farming since August 2021. That's when I got my first farm. And my second farm came in January. I'm sorry, my first farm came in August 20. 20 and my second farm came in Jan 2021. So I'm new to farming. Uh, before freight farms, I had no history in farming. I've uh, always been a working person. I uh, uh, work as a project manager and I also do real estate. I uh, have my real estate license and so I'm going to do a little bit of dibble and dabbing in, in everything. Farming is now a side hustle for me. I love that story because you you really are um, the type of guy that wants to um, start many things and and, and uh, follow your passion. Um, so tell us like why why farming and how did you stumble upon container farming in particular? Uh, that's a good question. So for me, I think uh, my story started back in 2019, you know, when I was really trying to look for an opportunity to take advantage of some vacant land that I owned and also to establish a business system. Um, around that time, uh, I had a tragedy in my family, which my uh, father had passed away at the age of 56. And so um, it was around February and I remember coming back from the plane that, you know, I needed to do something. And I was determined to either make this freight farm things happen or not. So uh, at the time, um, there was an open house in Florida that was happening and we were able to uh, go there and visit Lotus House and uh, Hammock Greens. And so I wanted to be ready by that time to really get into farming and went through the application process and just kind of was able to get funding and get my farm off the ground, my dream off the ground from there. I remember meeting you that day in yeah, Miami. That's right. It was great. Um, that was such a special moment. That was the day that you really uh, became a freight farmer. Um, well, I suppose the day you get your farm is really the day, but mm -hmm. it was still momentous at the same time. Um, so there, there were a lot of things that you experienced when you were trying to get your plans um, together. So let's walk through exactly what you were doing to prepare for starting this venture. Like, what about land? Let's talk about Financing is going to be a whole mm. conversation. So let's start with land. That one's <laughs> maybe a little bit quicker. Exactly. So um, at the time, I owned some vacant property. And one thing I found out uh, through the process is that your property needs to be zoned uh, for farming. And in Indianapolis, the property I owned was zoned for residential. So that threw a stumble into my roadblock. Fortunately for me, you know, I was connected with a friend of mine who owned a commercial property, uh, MJ used car lots. And so we were able to make a deal with them and got a commercial lot uh, to put our property on, uh, put our farm on. Uh, once we got that, it was trying, it was time to get the funding for it. And so um, went through the USDA, you know, the USDA loan project. Process. And if you were able to listen to my story uh, when the first time I came on, you know, I told about my experience with the USDA loan and it wasn't a pleasant one. Let me say that uh, I was challenged a lot. The business I was denied three times and uh, eventually I had to go through an appeal process in order to get funding for my farm. So um, it was one of those things where, you know, it's you kind of kind of work and persevere and get through the hurdles before you can really accomplish your dreams. Absolutely. Um, many of our farmers uh, experience hurdles with finding financing and funding sources. Um, so 
even though it's common, your your situation was definitely still unique. So you you were denied um, your loan a couple times, uh, and then let's talk about how you navigated that and how eventually you you were able to overcome it. Because, um, mm -hmm. you know, you the the hurdles. Um, this path is not always for the faint of heart. Like you you want to be able to to maintain um, some sort of motivation. So let's talk about like how you did that and how you navigated it. So some of the things that uh, most people are typically denied on is lack of experience and also um, not having a feasible business case. And that was what happened in my case. Um, in order to do that, um, I had to go and get some take some classes through Upstar University, which is an online hydroponic course. And I was up till like 2 a.m. in the morning taking those courses and just getting those certifications. Uh, and and uh, another thing I did was, you know, reach out to freight farms and was able to read through the manual and, and also look at the literature that was provided there. So once I was able to prove that um, I can plant seeds, you know, the next thing was going and establishing the business case, making sure that I had the proper application status and went through the process to get the funding. And so it wasn't an easy process, you know, it had to work through it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I, uh, Rick, my colleague, uh, supported you on one of your appeals, right? He sure did. He sure did. So, um, that was one thing too. Uh, once you get the application process filled that filled out, you know, there's a time frame in which they review the information you have and you have to rebuttal any um, questions that they have. Uh, my time frame was short because, like I mentioned, you know, I was headed to Florida and I was ready to get my down payment on for the farm, so I needed that money in order to get things moving. So I worked with Rick and I worked and I worked with him to get in, get the information to the USDA uh, for the micro loan, which eventually I was denied for. That happened back in December. I was already pot committed by then. So I had to go through the appeal process just to get the loan reevaluated. So eventually I was able to get in front of a USDA administrative judge and I had my case heard. Uh, between my, myself and the local farm service agency. Rick was able to support me. We started the case off with his testimony on what the farm can do. And then from that point on, it was just proven that I was capable of being a farmer and using my experience and the education that I had from the online courses and what I've learned through Freight Farm to prove I was capable of planting seeds. <laughs> So from that point on, uh, the USDA administrative judge ruled in my favor and uh, they overturned my microloan request. A few weeks later, they came back to me, the Farm Service Agency did, and it was like, okay, we're ready to go ahead and give you the loan. I was like, oh no, slow down. I don't want the 50,000. I want enough for two containers. Give me 200,000. <laughs> So and you I got scratched it. that. Yeah, I scratched that at that 50,000 application. You could scratch that. I just took that back and then reapplied uh, for the direct loan, which was a higher amount. And those loans go up to 500 K. And so uh, use a similar business case times two. And then went through the process again. And I was approved this time. Amazing. The the story, we, we absolutely go more into depth into Mario's process for finding financing in his webinar. So Amy, if you are able to potentially put the link to the recording in the chat, that would probably be really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, with all of these hurdles, uh, let's let's take one step back and talk about um, your your main motivation for becoming a farmer and kind of what was your what was your vision? What did you want to achieve? So uh, like I said before, I wanted to make use of some vacant property I had. I uh, also wanted to uh, establish a business system. You know, I work typical nine to five and I envision myself during retirement doing something that I love, something that can provide to the community. And so farming is one thing that I looked at in the doing, you know, Indianapolis, Indiana is in a what we call a food desert. And those who aren't familiar with the food desert, that's a term that they use to establish when you have no local access to fresh foods when in, within a certain vicinity of your neighborhood. And my neighborhood is in there. 
You know, we don't have fresh access to uh, vegetables and fresh foods. A lot of the stuff that we have gets imported in from either the South or the West Coast. So I wanted to be able to provide fresh access to foods for my community. And also personally, you know, I'd never had a fresh salad directly from, uh, you know, the, the, the vine, so to say. 40 some years old, I'd never had that. I wanted to experience that once. <laughs> Uh, one one other thing, you know, I wanted to also add to the number of black farmers out there. If you look at the numbers today, there's like 3% of African American farmers and uh, that's not good. You know, early in the 1900s, there was more representation of people of color, but over time we've lost our land and we lost our connection to farming. And I was part of that, you know, I was a city boy all my life and I wanted to get back to farming, get back to, uh, discovering what those farming roots were all about. But I didn't want to do it the traditional way. You know, you can't imagine me out there in the field. It's too hot. It's too cold. <laughs> it's too many bugs out there. You know, there's mosquitoes. It's too dirty. I don't like getting myself dirty. So this gives an alternative to farming, especially in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm able to farm year round. I mean, it's 27 degrees outside and it's 60 in the farm. So we're able to do this year round, provide an environment that's comfortable for people working in and also for plants to grow in. Uh, timing was right for me uh, at the time. I was the first one in Indiana to own a greenery. Now there's six more in Indiana since then. You know, I was the first African-American to own a greenery. Now there's about three or four more African-Americans that have joined the farming family. And uh, when laws change in Indiana, when it comes to cannabis, I'll be ready to take the lettuce down and put in the plant that sells more. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a perfect example of um, how much representation matters, because I remember that was one of the first things that you talked to about us about in Miami. You were like, you need more black freight farmers. And yeah. I feel like you have been able to be this incredible um, inspiration for so many other people to to actually take the leap and, and start farming as well um, and be a mentor for those folks. I've heard multiple people talk to me about you um, and how you've helped them um, on your journey. And now you're helping uh, hundreds more people all at once uh, with this one with this one event. So I can see I can see the questions coming in that want to dive into your business. Um, so you have two containers. You had one for how long did you have the one for like six months to a year? Yeah, I've got that in August 2020 and I've got the second one in Jan 2021. OK, so let's talk about who you sell to and how your business is set up. So most of my sales are through an online provider called marketwagon.com. Uh, it's an online farmer's market where uh, people like you and I can go online and place their order and they can have it supplied by local artisans and vendors around your area. And so uh, what Market Wagon looks like is you'll go on the website, you'll place your order for all the things you want and they'll have delivery days to you on Tuesday and Thursday. For me on Monday and Wednesday, I'll get a pick ticket of all the things that people have ordered from me. And then what I will do is I'll take that pick ticket, go on the farm and pick all the fresh uh, herbs or leafy greens and lettuces that people have ordered, package them up with our label and then drop them off on Tuesday morning or Thursday morning inside of a building that has all kind of bags lined up with numbers. So what I would do is I go inside that building, go up to the bag with the number, place that certain order in, and you know I get paid at the end of the, when all the orders are dropped off. Another way I get uh, business is through my website. Uh, people also order through there, and then I have it either ready for them to come pick up or I do deliver as well. And we also get uh, restaurant orders. They're not as consistent as I like, but you know we do get them every so often. I also have a local CSA that we provide to on the east side of uh, Indianapolis and every month they'll order uh, a certain amount of lettuce from me that they will use to provide to their community. So it's a different variety of uh, income streams, but most of it is through the marketwagon.com. Mm -hmm. And you know this is a it's an in, the market wagon model is an interesting direct to consumer uh, model, which 
if anyone's less familiar with direct and consumer models, we'll also talk about that in the next session um, with JC and Brooke as well. So it's a way for you to sell directly to a customer, but you don't necessarily know who your customers are, right? Correct. You do not own the relationship of the customer. So you don't see the names and stuff, but you still can communicate through Market Wagon and through their uh they're what they have set up. And do you get repeat customers? Oh yeah, yeah, I get a lot of repeat customers and uh, people that will order my product and you know will order from me every week. And I do recognize the names, so shout out to those people that order from me. Thank you for your support. <laughs> and what are they saying about the the produce that you're you're growing and supplying to them? Oh, five star. You know, it's great. I mean, it's 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 fresh. It lasts longer in the refrigerator, and uh, you know, it's one of a kind. It's what sets me aside from the standard uh, providers. You know, the freshness and the length of how long the product lasts. Oh, for sure. Um, so, can you elaborate a little bit on what you're growing exactly in your two farms? Yeah, so I grow in three categories right now. I grow herbs, leafy greens, and lettuces. As far as herbs, we grow different kinds of basil, uh, sweet basil, sweet Thai basil, uh, Italian large leaf Genovese basil. Uh, we grow thyme, and we also grow parsley and cilantro. Uh, in terms of leafy greens, we grow different kinds of kale, uh, white Russian kale, black magic kale, Toscano kale. We have a nice kale mix that we like to put together and sell to our customers. And in, let in terms of lettuces, we grow all kinds of varieties of lettuces, um, starboard lettuce, romaine lettuce. Um, I mean, sorry, that's said starboard. I meant starfighter. Uh, and, uh, the names are all so interesting. <laughs> Once I'm telling you, you get that Johnny Seeds catalog and it's like uh, vegetable porn. You know, you just go <laughs> through and like, oh, I, wanna, I want that. <laughs> this one, this one. The names are just yeah. hysterical. And so they have differentiating names. You can't get them mixed. Though. Right, right. Yeah. Um, awesome. And do, you said to me that your one of your farms is entirely dedicated to lettuce production. That is correct. So um, one of my farms is entirely dedicated to lettuce. And that's because we like to keep the settings, uh, something that's feasible to lettuce, you know, the pH and the temperatures. And like Derek was explaining in the earlier segments, it's a really sophisticated piece of equipment. So you can fine tune it to what you want to grow. And we do have one of our containers fine tuned to what lettuce likes in the environment that they like to grow in. And awesome. Um, and what was the learning curve like for you um, seeing that you didn't necessarily have any, any official farming experience? Um, what was it like? I didn't have any farming experience. <laughs> so for me, it was like, I, I needed to learn everything I could. I mean, I needed to learn. And I was new to the game, new to farming. Um, so I had to learn pricing. I had to learn marketing. I had to learn how to operate the equipment. Uh, I had to learn to keep my tanks filled. I had to learn to check my pH. And if it wasn't for that farm hand, hand app that you know, Derek was talking about, I'd probably be lost. <laughs> I don't know how many times that I've, uh, you know, left something on, forgot to turn something on, forgot to turn something off. And then, you know, leave the farm when I'm busy and can just look on my phone and turn it off or on through farm, through farm hands. So uh, that really eases the learning curve and getting to know the piece of equipment. But after that, it's just, learning how to keep the equipment running, you know, learning how to do the weekly sanitation, uh, keep, do, do the calibration, keep the tanks filled. And outside of operating equipment, you have to build your own market within your area and your facility. And that's how you really get to increase sales over time. And let's, let's talk about how you scaled the business and where you are now with operating the container. Because I can see people asking, <laughs> How, how are you juggling it all if you have a full-time job and you have two greeneries? I hired a farm hand. <laughs> so you That's have a what human, I did. I pay someone a, to do that. Yeah. You have a human farm hand and the software farm hand. And it's there just, you go. they take care of everything for you. Yeah. So I've, I have hired uh, someone that comes in on Monday and Wednesday and 
does the harvest. He starts at like 9 a.m. So by the time I get off work, the bag, the package is already packed, you know, and things are cleaned up. He also helps me out on the weekend. It's, it's just good having someone to help out. You know, I've quickly got overwhelmed with juggling so many roles, uh, husband, father, uh, full-time worker, real estate agent, and a farmer, you know, you can get quickly overwhelmed. And smart people would know that in order to have what's most important, which is time, you need to be able to delegate a lot of tasks to people who can handle them. And the guy who I've got working, he's he's great. You know, he loves doing the job. He loves coming in here and, and helping out. And he's I'm glad to have him around. I'm sure because um, so many people are um, are always wondering, like, how much time does it actually take? Uh, do you need to hire someone? And, and for your situation in particular, you are such like a a multitasker, mm -hmm. entrepreneurial spirits, pretty much like do everything person. Um, so you want to have your hand in in multiple different things, which allows you to hire an employee to actually um, take care of maybe a, a bulk of of the the operations. Yeah. Um, Amy's keeping me on time, but so I'm trying to like incorporate questions from people as we're talking as well. Um, let's go back to uh, packaging, pricing, um, and like how exactly you're selling. So um, how, 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 how does that work? Everything from like the volume that people are purchasing and how you're pricing it based on the volume. Um, so I like to, simple rule for me is a dollar an ounce that's the minimum I'm going to sell my product for, you know, <laughs> I like to keep it at that. You know, I, I'm sure I can get more, but you know, the minimum I'm going to go for is a dollar an ounce. So when it comes to um, herbs, you know, a half ounce will be like $2 to me. Uh, one ounce may be a little bit more than that, but my lettuce is typically where you see around a dollar an ounce pricing. Um, my packaging is plastic containers. Uh, I have packaged for three ounce, half ounce, and one ounce sizes. Uh, it's pretty simple. I'll put a sticker on them that has identification of the business, business name, a QR code, and information on the product and its storage. And for a lot of our lettuces, we just use standard plastic bags and a little tie wrap and put the sticker on there. And do you um, do you feel like your produce is differentiated from other people on Market Wagon? Um, I think it is because of the freshness. You know, I mean, I've seen how other people package their stuff as well, and they use similar packaging as I do. Uh, so, it, yeah, I think it's differentiated in the taste and the freshness, and that's typically where you see a lot of the customer responses when it comes to um, the, the feedback that I've received on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, definitely. Um, okay, so let's let's talk. It's funny because when we talked the first time in your in your webinar, you only had um, probably a little less than four months under your belt, which is wild right. to think about because time time has just absolutely flown by since you got your farm. Now yes. that you're you're a seasoned farmer, how do you feel like um, this lifestyle is for you? What are some maybe um, what what's it like being your own boss in this department, or just how do you feel overall? It's crazy that you say I'm a seasoned farmer now. <laughs> Who would imagine? But yeah, uh, so I think farming has opened up a lot of doors for me. Um, a lot of people are excited and want to hear about my story. And being that I'm African-American, it gives it a little bit more emphasis. And, you know, I want to use this as an opportunity to know to allow people like me to allow them to know that there's alternative paths to farming. So it's kind of opened up doors for me and gave me, you know, some opportunities to be in the spotlight on different publications. I was featured on the Indianapolis Business Journal uh, front page. I was featured in the Indianapolis Star. Um, there's a soon uh, PBS. They shot a segment. They're doing a documentary. They did a documentary on my farm on the 14th on for uh, Business Indiana, I think it's called Journey Indiana. And so hopefully that'll show pretty soon. 
and uh, I also connect that on to my farm. Um, it's just been a lot of, oh, also uh, the state fairgrounds. Every year, the Indiana State Fair uh, has what they call a featured farmer. And so they, they feature a different farmer for each day of the Indiana State Fair. So they've chosen me to be a featured farmer on August 6th of this year at the Indiana State Fairgrounds. So I'll be able to walk around the fair and do, and do different Q&A sessions. They'll have my banners up there and people will be able to learn about hydroponic farming. I was also able to connect and with different people as well, you know, people that I wouldn't have been able to meet before. Uh, future farmers of America, I've been able to give them tours. Uh, Spring Mill Elementary, I've been able to speak to a few classes there. It's, it's just opened up a lot of doors and created a lot of opportunity for me to get my message out there and also let people know that hydroponic farming is an alternative way to farm. And inside of a shipping container is another way to do it. Mario, how did I forget to have you talk about this other thing that you're doing with the farm that is connected to uh, Airbnb? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I give farm tours. Yeah, so, I'd, so uh, there's been a lot of interest in people that want to see the farm. So I've started to put, I put it on Airbnb and I do farm tours, $50 a head. I mean, that's a, it's a great source of revenue for you yeah. um, because so many people are interested in seeing the farm and it does become a bit of a, I don't want to say burden to constantly be hosting people, but um, it needs to be worth your time because you're taking yeah. the time out of your day. So I, I really find that um, very interesting. So it's on the Airbnb experiences page yeah. for Indianapolis. Um, okay, let's talk about your book too. Yes, yes. Shipping Container Farming. I wrote this book, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, the, the, since 2019, I've been through a lot of up and downs and writing this book was almost like therapy for me. One, to kind of get my story out there, put it on paper, and also to let people know that, you know, there's a way to get funding out there. It's through the USDA and, um, I've also put in my case study. If you try to look for it, it'll be hard to find. But if you bought the book, you know, you can even get the actual case of the USDA in there. So that kind of helps you read about it. And if you were to go down this path, at least you have some ammunition that you can go into the FSA uh, with. But, you know, this is one, this is my first book. I'm proud of it. <laughs> It's something that, you know, I needed to do. I wanted to get my story out there and also kind of let people know that, um, you know, it's, there's opportunity out there in shipping container farming. So I encourage anyone who's interested in it to get a copy. It's available on Book Baby. That's the best place to get it on bookbaby.com. It's also available on other sites like Amazon and it's uh, available through the, um, through the app, you can download an ebook as well. Mm -hmm. And we will be giving away five copies of Mario's book. So if you don't, if you're not one of those lucky winners, absolutely support Mario um, in this amazing endeavor. I think it is a, I can only imagine how vulnerable of an experience it would be writing a book, especially knowing your story and, um, yeah, I, I can imagine, like you said, it's, it feels like therapy, it must be cathartic, um, but it's also super impactful because other people have even used this as a resource, right? You, you told yeah. me that some, <laughs> some uh, person who was interested in, in getting started freight oh, yeah. farming took it, took it to yeah. his, um, his loan officer or something? Correct, right? correct. Uh, there's a few people, uh, Otho Farrow, Northern Indiana, he was able to establish his business through the same method of me by going through the USDA and uh, he didn't have as much trouble because he was able to take the information that I gave him and <laughs> start off with that. He said, I want to do exactly what this guy is doing. Uh, I've also heard of another guy in New York. Um, I can't think of his name right now, who has is, who is recently went through the same process and he was close to getting approved as well. So it's just kind of given, you know, I believe in the saying, uh, 
don't go where the path may lead, but create a path so that others may follow. So this is creating a path so that one person can follow who wants to get their shipping container farm. And I mean, I love I love that you you said that because. I mean, even outside of your book, Mario, you have been such an amazing resource to our entire freight farming community. So I'm curious, like, what do you think about the network of farmers? Um, and, and tell us maybe a little bit about your experience working with other freight farmers. So I think there's a huge network out there. Uh, there's also um, a good collaboration between the farmers. There's a monthly forum that goes on where the greenery users call in and share experiences. And uh, we have an email chain going where we can talk and communicate uh, about different findings and different learnings that we have. So it's a constant community that goes on. You know, you're not left alone. You also can reach out to uh, the, the freight farms team who are willing to help. They're very responsive. They'll get back with you with an email or a phone response on any inquiries that you will have. Uh, there's the freight farms community as well, where a lot of the historic findings are posted on there. So you can go online and uh, look up different learnings and stuff. And if you have any trouble, you know, there's help out there. Mm hmm Definitely. And, and you are a resource uh, for folks as well. So I can yeah. I can see people looking for specific questions about you. Um, so I really? definitely I definitely want to tell everyone that's asking questions about Mario to talk to your account executive and they will connect you directly with Mario. Um, that way he can he can have a either a conversation with you or um, get you in for a farm tour if you'd actually like to to visit him as well um okay any any last thoughts mario no not for me i mean i just encourage anyone who's learning you know make sure you do your deal due diligence, uh, find out if this will work in your market. And, you know, if you really want to get involved, you have your account representatives that can help you through the process. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Mario. I hope I answered as many people's questions throughout my interview with you. So I think we are good on that front. Um, have a great day. Everyone follow Mario on Instagram. Be sure that you also just check out his website. We'll put all the links in the chat as well so you can stay up to date with all of his progress. And again, we will be giving away five copies of Mario's awesome book, Shipping Container Farming. Um, hopefully it will be a good resource for you uh, in, in your journey to get started. Thank you so much, Mario. It's always, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much for having me, Caroline. And like you mentioned, you know, we're active on social media. So follow us, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks awesome. again. Thanks, Mario. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, we are going to move on to our next session with JC and Brooke. I will let you both uh, take it from here. Sure thing. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Hello, everyone. I am JC. Um, so, again, I am the growth marketing manager here at Freight Farms and really excited to talk to you guys today about. Um, building a successful business or project with uh, your Greenery S. Awesome, thanks JC. I'm Brooke and I've probably had the pleasure of talking with a number of you and others of you are working with my colleagues. So I'm excited to jump into things with JC today as well and give you an idea of the successful business case and how you can craft it. Um, first things first, we are gonna put a survey up on the screen. So just help us get a better idea of where everyone's at in there freight farming journey. So <clears throat> feel free to take some time, fill that out. We'll keep it up um, as we work through the next couple of slides before really diving in. Um, just kind of a lay of the land in terms of what you should expect in the next few minutes from JC and I. We really just want to be able to give you as much information as possible to guide you through essentially, you know, your checklist of things that you need to be thinking about and addressing to structure a good business plan for a hyperlocal farming operation in your community. But um, 
keep in mind that each business model is going to look different depending on your goals. There's, there's going to be things that will vary from what we talked through today, but there is certainly a science behind what creates something that's successful. So just keep that in mind. That's what we're trying to give you guys today, the science behind what you can do to craft a successful business in farming. <clears throat> so we'll start by reviewing different sales channels, going over the pros and cons um, for you to consider, and then diving into a sample business plan. And then we'll stop um, at the end with some questions around marketing, branding, and financing. Um, so before we get into all that, the first most important question, question that you should be asking yourself is what's your why? This is kind of like a high level question, but ultimately answering that for yourself will direct the way that you develop your business. So perhaps it's, you want to get into vertical farming to get freedom from your nine to five. You want to be your own boss. Maybe you see a need for local food and you want to address that issue and impact your community. Maybe it's a combination of all of those or something else. But once you address that question, that will help you drive essentially how you want to craft your business model. Um, for example, if you know you want to have a side business, you're going to need to find efficiencies to create a, a good workflow so that you can balance it out with your existing career like Mario talked about today, some of the things he's done to optimize um, his, his side hustle in farming. Then if you wanted to perhaps just create the highest profit margins, you might wanna look at simply direct to consumer sales for um, the most margin on, on your sales um, or some type of hybrid. So there's, there's a lot of things to consider um, and I'll let JC kind of jump into what all of those things are. Thanks, Brooke. Um, so as Brooke mentioned, we'll go through each of these sales channels. And these are the, the sales channels that um, our customers, freight farmers all over the world have found success with. Um, but keep in mind that you can sell to multiple channels. Um, we even recommend that. Uh, and you might even have like a hybrid of the two, similar to Mario as he's selling to um, market wagons, it's almost a combination of a CSA and a farmer's market. So just know that you're not beholden to just one. You can um, kind of play around with all four of them um, to find what works for you. All right. So jumping right into community supported agriculture, also known as CSAs. I saw a question in the Q&A earlier asking, what is a CSA? Well, I am here to tell you. So a CSA is basically a subscription model um, where your subscribers uh, pay, prepay a fixed amount um, so that they get produce on a weekly basis and you know exactly how much you need to grow to keep up with demand. Um, this is also nice because you're paid up front. Uh, which is great for your operations. Um, but some things to keep in mind with a CSA is that you need that customer base. So we like to say, look for customers in unexpected places like affinity groups. So fitness centers, craft breweries, maybe even your child's school, um, somewhere where there's people who would be interested in something like this that um, are like-minded and are looking for like more artisanal goods um, and are willing to pay a higher price point for them. Also, your participation in farmers markets can give you a good um, customer base. You know, you can develop that relationship with those individuals at your farmers market, let them know that you're gonna start a CSA subscription um, and let them know, you know, that they can get a discount maybe if they sign up from the farmers market uh, just to get them um, involved and to be a loyal customer. We'll go through operational considerations for each of these channels. So um, you just have the upfront and transparent information that you need. So just to, to dive in with CSAs, it is it, or it can be packaging intensive. It's kind of flexible and it's up to you for what you decide you want to do. It can be as simple as these brown paper bags or it can be a little bit more elaborate. It can also be um, distribution intensive. It's also kind of dependent on what you choose to do. Um, if you deliver to every home of each subscriber, that could be very intensive, but you could also have like maybe five pickup locations at a local coffee shop, at a gym, that people are already going to those locations and they can just pick it up there. So it saves you from driving all around town. Uh, and then 
you also will need or might need to think about member retention strategies. And a good one that we have seen from freight farmers is um, having like a referral program for your existing subscribers. So if they refer a friend to sign up, they get like 20% off that week's share. Um, so just some things to keep in mind. With pricing, it's again, so nice that you're paid up front and know exactly how much you need to grow. Um, and you can demand a higher price point because there's no middleman in between you and the end customer. And then for your marketing considerations as you're building your business, you can use social media to recruit new subscribers. And um, on your website, you want to consider having a store um, web page for sign up and pick up information. And if you're like, JC, I have no idea how to build a store web page on my website. Um, do not fear when you become a freight farmer. We have um, a slew of materials and even in farm camp, um, the training service that we offer, we go through um, some different web hosting uh, platforms and resources for you to make sure that you have everything that you need. All right, uh, with restaurants kind of switching gears to business to uh, business. So first with restaurants, you'll wanna develop a relationship with the chef. And remember that um, the times to visit and meet with a chef may not be the times that always work best for you. You'll want to visit them after lunch and before that dinner rush, uh, and maybe even bring them some samples and know that they, their time is kind of limited just depending on um, how many customers they have in their restaurant. Um, you'll also want to find the right price for your produce. Chefs are willing to pay more for local produce, especially from a farmer with no seasonal constraints. Uh, so that means that the, the chef doesn't have to search for new vendors in the off season, which is a win-win for both you and them. Uh, and then you'll also want to distinguish yourself as reliable. Um, make sure that you communicate that you can grow pretty much anything that they want. Um, you know, all those funky herbs or, um, you know, things that are very particular to a certain part of the world, you're able to grow that. Uh, so just let them know that you're flexible and, and can be reliable throughout the whole, you know, whole year, 365 days a year. Yeah. And something just to like tag in there, JC, is I've heard of a few customers that I've worked with that have prioritized the restaurant segment, actually inviting chefs to come see their farm. Um, once they have it, and that can be a really useful tool for you to just kind of show people how it works, um, having a tasting with them. Um, obviously, that's something you need to do post having your farm and being up and operating. But um, it's another way to sort of let people know they can know their farmer and actually know their food, um, which for certain chefs is really, really important. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, just like everyone here um, on this call, you are you are wanting to see the farm and what's I'm sure you saw the farm even on a video it was amazing and chefs and your customers are going to feel the same way once they see the farm and see how things are growing they're just going to be astounded so um yeah definitely Brooke having having people come visit your farm is great um some operational considerations with restaurants is that you can deliver in bulk, which is really nice because it saves you on packaging costs. So you can just put them in big containers like you see here on the screen. Um, and you can deliver on a weekly basis. So you're only going out and spending money on fuel once a week. Um, also for pricing, again, local commands a higher price point. So that's, you know, you can always command, again, higher price point. Um, and you may be competing with wholesalers, but you can offer the stability that they can't. Um, and also your product has a longer shelf life and less food waste, which is very important um, to restaurateurs. Uh, and that stability is becoming increasingly important to them because of just all the supply chain issues we're seeing and I've seen in the past month, months. <laughs> Um, and then for marketing considerations, you can use your website to inform chefs of your capabilities as well if, if they're not able to come see your farm in person. Um, and then once you're, you have those restaurant customers locked down, you can ask them to tag you on social media of like the dishes that they've created that feature your produce. Um, this is Island Leafy Greens is one of our uh, customers in Washington State and that this is a photo of one of their restaurant uh, customers. 
All right, switching back to um, business to consumer with farmers markets. This is uh, probably my favorite channel because I grew up selling to farmers markets. Um, as a as a child, my family had a small um, farming business. Um, so you've likely visited a farmer's market as a consumer. They're popping up everywhere. There's a lot to choose from. You'll first want to research all the farmer's markets near you um, and see which ones fit with your business goals the best. Um, likely ones that are year round are gonna be best for you because you're gonna be growing year round. Um, and also look into those alternative options like Market Wagon. Uh, we've heard of several different freight farmers across the US at least doing like a, a hybrid model or like a pickup farmer's market model. Um, so that could be really uh, nice option for you. Once you decided on a farmer's market to sell to and if it's an in-person one, um, and even if it's not, there's probably still ways digitally to attract those customers. For in-person, um, you can create this inviting booth with clear signage um, and maybe even give out samples if that's allowed. Uh, and maybe even flyers, coupons. Um, also, you know, just educating how you're growing with photos of inside the farm um, and keep your community updated of what farmer's markets you're going to be at by posting on your website and social media, like, hey, I'll be at the downtown farmers market today and then i'll be at the midtown one tomorrow um, just so they know where to find you and then know that there are going to be other produce vendors at the farmers market maybe even growing the same crops that you are but they're not going to be growing it in the same way so you want to differentiate yourself by really showcasing that you are growing the cleanest crops again by showing pictures of inside the farm um, educating the consumers on what hydroponics uh, is so that they just really understand it and are more inclined to purchase from you. Considerations here is that the packaging can range just as with CSAs, it can be as simple or as elaborate as you would like. You are often working weekends and long hours, but if you're again doing like a hybrid model with that market wagon, then you might not be working uh, weekends and long hours. And with the in-person uh, farmer's markets, at least, they're usually the booth fee and it could range anywhere from 10 to $40, just depending on the popularity of that farmer's market. Uh, so you'll just wanna build that into your business plan. And for pricing, you don't have a middleman here either, but just be careful of excess inventory. Um, if it's an off week, maybe the weather isn't nice, there's less foot traffic or Maybe it's 4th of July weekend or around Christmas or something. There's just not as many people coming to the market. You might be taking more inventory home than you're used to. So just think about creative ways of how um, to use that inventory. Maybe you partner with a local nonprofit to give it to them. Um, just some things to keep in mind. And for marketing, um, again, list those farmers markets on your website. And I think I already mentioned about social media, so they are all good there. All right, and last but not least, specialty food and grocery stores. Um, as with restaurants, you'll first want to think about building that relationship with who's gonna be buying the produce, and that's the produce buyer of the grocery store. So um, you want to come in and being friendly and knowledgeable about your produce, maybe even offer them some samples as well, um, and know that they're gonna, be interested in what you're growing because you're a hyper-local farmer, um, but they're probably also going to be price conscious as well. So you'll want to just start thinking about your pricing and you know be firm and negotiate a fixed price and highlight that, that hyper-local, hydroponically grown aspect of your produce. Once you have your, your um, produce in that grocery store, you can create in-store displays. And those displays, um, could educate the end consumer, the grocery store shoppers about your produce so that it moves off the shelf quicker. And that shows that you are invested in um, not only your success, but the success of the store, which that just builds a better relationship with you in that produce buyer. Um, so that is always a good thing. All right, and with our considerations here, uh, grocery stores have the highest packaging costs just because the store may have uh, special 
um, specifications for the actual size of the packaging, what the label needs to look like or include. You might need to get some food safety certifications as well. So just keep that in mind. Um, you also, again, need to be price competitive and you may need to work with the middleman, but it's really dependent on if you're selling to a, a large grocery, grocery store chain, um, something like Whole Foods, you'll likely need to work with the middleman. But if it's a small regional, like there's just one or two, you can probably sell directly into them. Um, and again, just know that you can demand a higher price point for your product because it's local and hydroponically grown. And with your packaging, make sure that it's creative and eye-catching and really communicates your story to that shopper. Um, and then with your website, list out all the stores that you're selling to. Uh, Town to Table here in Boston does a great job of that. They sell to all of these different little um, neighborhood stores and even tell you how far away their farm is from the shelf in that grocery store. All right, so as I mentioned, when we started, we jumped into the sales channels. Um, you definitely wanna find a mix and match of which ones work for you so that you can sell all of your produce every week. You can diversify to protect your business. And lastly, we always encourage you to start wide, try out each one and narrow in on which one works the best for your business um, and your goals. Awesome, um, thanks JC. So now you've gotten sort of a lowdown on the most popular sales channels. We want to get into some actual numbers for you behind what makes those channels work. So for the next few slides, I'm going to walk you through a sample P&L for the Greenery S. It'll uh, show you a diversified crop mix and also just the business and financial decisions behind that um, decision and, and get, get to the numbers of how those, how those crops turn into the revenue and the profit. So we'll go into the PL and then some channel specific models. Um, and just so you are aware, this is one example of hundreds of different ways that you can make the numbers work for you. So um, you'll likely have some differences than what you see here, but this is a great place to sort of start out if you're uncertain of how to create a business model that works. Um, so with that, we'll look at the sample P&L and um, here it is. So again, this is a great place to start if you're not sure how you want to structure your business when getting, getting off up and running. So on the left, you see the assumptions behind the numbers that you're seeing on the right. In this example, the farmer is growing, you see at the bottom there, four different crops and selling into three of the most profitable sales segments that we see our customers work with. We do recommend um, working with a blend of sales channels, something like what you see here about 40% direct to consumer, 30% grocery, and 30% restaurants. This will help you to diversify your revenue stream giving you some security in your operations in case things change from week to week. Um, and also just help you to find out what is most lucrative for your operation over time as you change and focus on different segments. You'll see here with this mix and these crops, this customer is bringing in about 136,000 in revenue each year with the net profit at 79,000. Um, like I said, over time, you are going to change the percentages of the channels based on who's ordering most consistently and what you can charge for a premium price. So it'll change, but again, this is sort of a good baseline to work with. So moving on, this is the breakdown of the crop and yield planning um, behind that PL example. So if you remember in the the tour earlier today with Derek, there are 88 panels in the farm. And you're essentially dividing them into four sections because you're growing four different crops. So here you have one section for the salad mix, one section for basil, one section for head lettuce, and then one section for kale. This crop mix 
turns out to be about 568 pounds of produce per month. Um, that's, that's your yield. You are harvesting on a weekly basis though, keep in mind. So these four crops are certainly economical to grow. They're in demand pretty much everywhere you go and they grow fairly well together. And you will notice if you see um, the distribution of these four crops that it's pretty lettuce heavy. So that is pretty common. Um, there's actually over 50% of what's being grown in here as lettuce. And reasons behind that is actually uh, statistics show that 90% of Americans eat lettuce at least once a day. So people are eating it, it's popular, and you'll be able to sell it if you're tapping into the right segments. So that's, that's why you see it so lettuce heavy here. Um, but also kale is another high yielding leafy green, so popular to focus on there. And then basil is a example of a crop that demands a premium. So it's good to focus on something like that, where it's a high value crop um, that honestly you probably won't be able to find the quality that you can provide anywhere else. Um, so here's an example of sort of segment specific um, profits. And you'll see here, as JC discussed earlier, that direct to consumer is the segment with the highest price point. Um, if you were taking that crop mix and that distribution of a farm and selling it 100% direct to consumer, uh, you're gonna see that your top line would obviously increase quite a bit. In that example that we just saw a couple slides ago, that was only at 40%. So just keep that in mind. One reason why you might not want to do 100% direct to consumer is that it can be more labor intensive. Think about your dealing with single orders um, and that of course is going to take more time in packaging and potentially distribution. Um, and it also takes a bit longer to build up that customer base. Typically this kind of segment grows by word of mouth and just developing your social channels, which isn't gonna necessarily be at 100% right off the bat. So again, why we recommend starting with a mix of that at 40%, but you could grow it to something higher um, as you develop your business and operations um, in your first few months. Um, and then this is the same uh, model essentially for both grocery and restaurant. Uh, you see here the price per ounce is actually based on some surveys that we got back from a group of farmers. And you'll notice that groceries are actually paying more for produce per ounce in head um, than restaurants. Something just to note here is that this is going to look different depending on the restaurant that you're working with and the grocery you're working with. Each of them will have different prices, quality, other things that they're used to from buying, buying through their current distributor. So JC alluded to this earlier, but if you're able to, it's best to find time to review the current costs, food waste, issues with supply that either the produce buyer, chef, or the restaurateur is experiencing. Once you're able to understand their needs, their issues, you're gonna be able to work with them to show them how you could offer a solution. And negotiating prices from there will be a much easier process because you'll be able to understand where you can meet their needs. That's probably not a first touch conversation that you'd have with a customer, but just sort of an idea of how you can develop that trust and customer base further. Um, down the line. So we've gone over, you know, your, your revenue, how you're selling those crops, what you want to aim to sell them at. As Mario mentioned, aiming for that dollar and average per ounce across your produce production is a really good goal. Um, but now that we're done with that, we're going to move on to operating costs. And there's three main buckets that you are going to want to focus on, on how you can optimize those costs. There's a fourth part of this, which is your consumables, your, oper your operating costs um, in terms of growing supplies, but those stay pretty fixed. So these are the three that you can pay attention to to perhaps um, adjust um, how, how you can improve your, your revenue um, and um, your net profit. So the first section is your labor. Each week, you will probably be spending about 20 hours a week in the farm doing your tasks throughout the week, seeding, transplanting, harvesting, and cleaning and maintenance. Um, this will depend on what your mix of revenue streams are, your customer segments, 
um, how much time you're going to be dedicating outside of that. But that's a good average for in-farm time. Um, and if you're operating one to two or three farms, you might be taking home net income as pay for yourself. But if you are hiring someone on, as, as Demario talked about earlier, um, you're going to need to be allocating an hourly wage towards paying that, that farmhand. Um, rent is the second thing. It can be a really significant cost. Uh, we really recommend saying below $1,000 per month, if not being able to avoid it entirely. A couple things that you can do to avoid uh, keeping that cost high or um, not paying it at all is perhaps striking a deal with a local business, maybe someone that's a customer of yours or a potential customer, working with them on co-branding and marketing uh, and being able to negotiate a lower rent um, there. Or a local organization, perhaps like a food bank that you could donate a portion of the produce to and use some of their space. Um, and then the last thing is the utilities. So the farm uses an average of about 160 to 230 kilowatt hours uh, per day. So that'll depend on the settings you implement, but the average cost per kilowatt hour in the uh, United States is about 10 cents, which will get you to about $580 a month for your utilities bill on average. This is probably going to be your highest monthly expense. You can offset it with solar or uh, renewable energy. We have a partnership with Arcadia, which essentially, um, if it's available in your state and zip code, they'll match 100% of your consumption by purchasing an equivalent amount of clean energy in the form of renewable energy certificates. So that can be one way to make your operation a bit more green and perhaps save some money depending on where you're located. And that's it for operating. So on to JC for brand. Sorry, I forgot I muted myself. <laughs> I'm really struggling with the mute today, you guys. Uh, so just changing gears to talking about branding your business or your project um, or even your school or nonprofit. Um, I think all of these things are applicable to, to really any kind of business or project that you are doing. Um, so first you wanna think about your name, which is very important because it's your signifier and really tells your story. Um, here are some great examples of freight farmers around the world and their names and logos. Um, but some things that you'll want to think about before you just create something that sounds fun um, and looks pretty is um, thinking about if that website, if the website URL is available for that name um, and if the social media handles are available. Uh, and if they're not for that name, it could be confusing for people when they're trying to search for you. Um, so we'll just maybe you wanna think about how you, could you change that name or maybe add something to it to differentiate yourself. Um, so that you're easily searchable and people can follow along and learn more about your business and purchase from you. All right. And as you're building your brand, um, here are some things to think about. Your brand is incredibly important. Um, it is your identity. Um, and I like to say before you are develop a brand and, and you're going out to sell, you need to think or you need to look within. So think about um, how do you want people in your world uh, to view you and feel about you in your business? What are your values? Um, some of those things that Brooke talked about early on in the first slide, what are those things that you um, want to communicate with both your goals and your values to the end consumer? Um, I like to say, or like the famous saying goes, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. So be sure to communicate, you know, what you're standing for and why you're doing what you're doing. Cool. Um, so we've taken the time to define, you know, goals, who your customers can be, how you make the numbers work, marketing, branding. Uh, there's a lot to think about and develop there, but once you've been able to work through that, typically the next step is financing. So we're certainly here to help guide you through the financing process. There's so many options out there. And ultimately what is best for each individual is just dependent on the applicant, your business model um, and things like that. So here's some popular options we see customers pursue. 
The first are small business loans through the SBA. Um, these are most plentiful loans that are available out there for for-profit businesses. There's hundreds of options, both through local banks, um, or online companies. Most do require at least one year of business experience and some do have minimum revenue numbers that they wanna see before lending out money. Um, so keep those things in mind. Second option is equipment financing. Um, that's an offering you can usually get from your small business lender. And since the Greenery S is a piece of equipment, um, instead of doing a comprehensive small business loan for operating, you might just be looking to finance the actual hardware itself. So something to consider there depending on your needs. Um, also government loans. So this is something that we, of course, talked a little bit with Demario about earlier. This is tends to be for people who don't have any experience in farming or sometimes even any experience in business. Um, if you are having trouble getting funding from a private lender, you might qualify for this. As a general rule, the USDA Farm Service Agency, or as maybe you hear us refer to the FSA, um, they're meant to be a funder of last resort. So this means that applicants were not able to get sufficient funds through a traditional lender. Um, and typically this process takes at its most expedited between three to four months. Um, so also another thing to keep in mind for timelines. And then the last option, this tends to be much more catered towards institutions and nonprofits is grants. Um, these are pretty competitive and are typically focused on certain initiatives, whether that's education or food security. Um, and again, best suited for those sort of nonprofit or educational impactful institutions, although there can be smaller ones out there for um, profit businesses. So that was um, a lot, <laughs> needless to say, we went over tons of information. Um, we'll have a poll come up in just a minute. Take, take a second to figure that out, um, answer some questions. And one thing I'll say before we go is there's tons of things to talk through and think about. Um, I'm an account executive, so I'm happy to talk with those of you that um, I've worked with. And for the rest of you, you have one of um, my colleagues that is happy to work with you through some of the specifics too. So please reach out and we'll talk more about it. Thank you, JC and Brooke. That was super, super helpful. Um, I We are definitely running short on time, but I have a couple questions that I just want to rattle off super quickly. Um, since we were just talking about financing in particular, and the business plan is such a critical part of securing your financing, Brooke, for people who are just starting a business for the first time and maybe don't have experience creating P&Ls or like actually trying to forecast what is um, going, what they're going to be making on their farm, what type of resource can you be for those people? Yeah, totally. Um, so we have a lot of information we've been able to collect. You saw some of that sample PL that we're, we've worked through. Um, and what that's allowed us to do is build tools that can help anyone create a business plan. Um, we have a business planning template that will allow you to create a unique crop mix, distribution to different sales channels, um, and ultimately adjust what your operating costs are based on your location. Um, myself, my colleagues, we're happy to work with you through that tool to make sure that it lines up well with your goals. Um, and we also have a business plan template that can help you actually write a, a, a business plan alongside of that, that financial tool, which will spit out the, um, the numbers that you need. Great. I, can't, I cannot stress that enough to everyone listening. If it seems kind of daunting or intimidating, utilize your account executive. And if you don't know who that is, um, in the follow-up email that we send, it will have their name and contact information. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for that. Real quick, Brooke, one more thing. Uh, is in the P&L that you presented in the cost analysis, was the loan payment included in that? I don't believe it was. I'm I don't think we had the slide that shows that, but we do have that same PL with the loan payment included. Didn't go into that much detail today. Okay. But that's another thing that we can absolutely provide through either a pre baked out resource 
or that business planning tool allows you a tab that shows the loan payment depending on what great your um and then are there any um insurance like what type of insurance should should folks be getting um if they're going to be running this as a business Yep. Most of our customers will get some sort of general liability insurance. Um, I know of a couple options that customers work with. One's called Flip. Um, there's another through Contain. So reach out to your account executive. We can absolutely get you some more information on that. Um, and it's, it's a good thing to have for sure. Definitely. All right. Last but not least, because um, you know every for, for those people who are looking to get started this year, what is the current lead time on a uh, receiving a farm if you were to purchase today? Yep. So from purchase to being able to ship it to you is about four months right now. Um, you can reach out to your account executive to get some more details on what placing an order would look like. Um, but that's that's the standard lead time at this point. Perfect. All right, JC, Brooke, thank you so much. Always a pleasure to learn more from you. Thank you. All right, we are going to head into our last session. Thank you to everyone that's staying on um, so far. I know it's a, a long event, but we're we're jamming it packed full of uh, great information. So Mark and Rachel should be popping up any minute now. Great, great. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to the after purchase journey. Hold on one second. Let me just share my screen real quick. I see a lot of familiar names here today. So I'm happy that everyone's been able to make the time to join us. Um, I know a, a few of you are looking to order your farms in the next month or so. So we are going to dive into what happens after you place your order. My name is Mark. I'm the customer success manager at Freight Farms. And in that role, uh, I have the privilege of getting to know all of those farmers uh, that Rachel was just talking about, that uh, largest um, group of cloud-connected farmers. Uh, we have about 400 farms in the world, uh, thousands of farmers, and all of them are bringing really unique uh, stories and perspectives to, to farming. Um, and so uh, the great thing about freight farms is that we have lots of resources for not just getting people information, but also connecting them so that they can share their experiences with each other um, when they are uh, setting out on their, on their farming journeys. Um, some of these farmers are coming from really unique places. We have 36 countries that are represented you know, whether these farmers are coming from way up north in Canada or Sweden, or they're on a remote Pacific island and they're looking to um, end kind of a dependence on imported food for their communities. Um, there's, there's lots of different stories. We have farmers who are small business farmers or are working in um, educational institutions, universities. Uh, we also have farmers who work with uh, nonprofits or hospitals or even resorts and spas. Um, so uh, all of these farmers kind of have the opportunity to, to share all of those experiences. Uh, and they're as interesting as, as Demario's that you heard earlier. So once you've decided that this is the path for you, the most important thing to do is really make sure you get a farm reserved. Uh, we are build to order. Uh, so as Brooke mentioned earlier, uh, current lead time is about three to four months. So to secure your spot in our shipping queue and, and really start the, the ball rolling for being a, an official customer with us, you will work with your account executive on my team who will draft you up a sale and purchase agreement for however many farms you want to start with. And as soon as we receive that contract signed back to us, as well as the first down deposit, then you are officially a customer, you're in our manufacturing queue and your account executive will be introducing you shortly to the support team to start the onboarding process. The first step in the onboarding process is just simply 
the onboarding meeting or, or first call. And that is really to get you introduced to your client support engineer, who will be your main point of contact on the support team moving forward. It's a great opportunity to just align on goals and expectations. So many people start this journey at kind of different stages. So some people, for instance, uh, are still looking for a site at this point. Others have found a site, but um, maybe working through some difficulties with uh, their business plan or uh, what have you. Uh, so it's really important for our team to get a handle on how we can best support you moving forward, what your vision is for the future, and your goals so they can help you get there. Um, it's also an opportunity, of course, for you to ask questions. Often this is when things get a little bit more technical because you're preparing for your farm uh, to arrive. So uh, great, great opportunity to set the groundwork for success moving forward. One of the biggest things you're gonna be doing in those couple months from signing the contract and then waiting for your farm's arrival is usually preparing your site. Most people will be doing that at this time. Um, and luckily you have a few months to deal with that. Uh, but as far as preparing your site does go, our team is very experienced in uh, shipping these farms all over the world. We typically will coordinate all shipping and delivery so it's not something that you have to worry about at all. Um, and, and during that time there, we're gonna make sure that your site is completely ready for your farm's arrival. So our team is going to be sending you a site checklist. You'll probably be having a lot of back and forth with questions, uh, just making sure that your site is uh, set up correctly for the correct electricity, uh, water, Wi-Fi, that your foundation's secure and good to go. And then once you receive the kind of final green light from them, you are on to actually getting your farm. Sorry about that on mute. Um, that's right. And, and we've talked a few times about um, the farmhand software um, and through farmhands, you have all kinds of resources that are available to you while you're getting your farm ready for delivery. Um, so you'll be in touch with your client support representative who can you know, talk to you, answer any questions, um, and they'll be in touch with you throughout the process of planning and on your farm delivery day. Uh, and they'll even give you a call on that day, make sure everything's running smoothly. Um, and you know, on farm arrival, it's a big deal. So uh, make sure that you take a lot of photos and videos uh, of that. It's an important step in your farming journey. Uh, and it's important not just for you, but for your your customers, any, any restaurants that you want to work with, a uh, great thing to share on social media. Uh, that's, it's, it's all coming together. Um, and once that comes, you know, we have lots of resources, including our support team to help you go from farm arrival to getting growing. Um, and that's all the part of uh, unboxing your farm. Uh, all of those steps are available um, in our academy and also in our knowledge base that has been mentioned before. Uh, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. So we, of course, have our shop. Uh, this is one of the important branches in that farmhand ecosystem um, where you have access to all kinds of things right at your fingertips. You can order um, everything from nutrients to grow plugs, uh, cleaning supplies and sanitizers, any uh, solutions that you might need, some replacement parts. Um, and one way that you can ensure that you have all of those before you run out uh, is that we have uh, subscriptions and bundles that are available uh, to help you save a little bit uh, of money when you order in advance. Uh, and then also you don't have to worry so much about running out and needing those supplies. Uh, so if you are getting started, we recommend uh, that you look into those, those subscriptions because um, they'll definitely get you everything that you need and you won't be starting your journey without them. So as far as training goes, um, we completely understand that people have different learning styles and preferences for how they retain information. So we have two um, kind of main offerings for training. Uh, the most popular is our 
Farm camp in person, we host it at our headquarters in Boston. It's a two day event and it is an event where you will be with a small group of freight farmers who are at the same stage in their farming journey as you, of course. So that's a huge benefit to taking part in this. It's a great networking event um, and a chance, I guess, to visit another city if you haven't been to Boston. Uh, we also have our on-site uh, training and launch, which is pretty straightforward, but that is where one of our uh, expert farmers will come to your location and it will be um, comprised of lessons in the farm and uh, kind of classroom lessons. Uh, but the, the biggest benefit to that is that you are having that one-on-one -on -one, uh, attention with your trainer so you can bombard them with all the questions you want. Not that you can't do that in the group setting, but um, it is a great opportunity to just have really hands-on uh, experience and, and kickstart your, your business that way. And then after, of course, uh, regardless of which training option you go with, you will uh, leave as a certified freight farmer and then have access to uh, the rest of the resources we have to offer um, and continued uh, customer support. So again, regardless of which option you go with, uh, we cover the same curriculum. Uh, so the, the curriculum has really been designed to uh, work for anyone from an expert to uh, someone who may not even have a green thumb. And uh, they're, they're really uh, designed to make you feel confident as a farmer. We're gonna go over everything from behind the scenes farmhand programming, uh, that keeps your farm running smoothly to pest and disease mitigation. So we will cover everything you need to know and more. That's right. I know it can feel a little bit like drinking from a fire hose right now with between the tour and all the information, but you know, we just heard from Demario who said he, he never really farmed before and now he's writing a book um, that's available to you. So um, all these tools are, are uh, designed to get you growing um, like the pros. Yeah. And, you know, it's completely normal and expected that you will probably deal with a learning curve in the beginning when you're getting your farm ramped up and you're learning how to farm and do hydroponics maybe for the first time. Uh, but that is, again, expected. Um, and we, we have tons of resources for you to make sure that you, again, are not alone and that it goes as smooth as possible. That's right. We have a, a lot of digital resources. Um, I think that's our next slide on there um, that talks about uh, some of the things that are available for you. Um, so in case you want to uh, learn everything that you need to before you get started, uh, we have our knowledge base and we have uh, Farmhand Academy. I think Caroline may have mentioned both of these before, um, but our Farmhand Academy is uh, kind of a uh, uh, a course of what you need to know in a sequential order so that you can learn everything from nutrients to um, how your pumps work um, to what a maintenance schedule looks like. And it's uh, filled with all kinds of videos um, and quizzes to help you assess your knowledge and figure out what you need to work on a little bit so that you feel confident before you get your farm. Uh, and then also we have our knowledge base, which is a little bit more searchable. Think of it more like a Wikipedia while you're farming and you're like, what was that thing that we needed to do again? And you could just do a quick search uh, and find all of that information just to put you on the best path to, to success. Yeah, and you'll have access to the Farmhand Academy and uh, knowledge base even um, right after that onboarding meeting. So most of the customers that I work with will start uh, the going through Farmhand Academy. You can take it at your own pace. Um, right after they, they place their order in those months, they just kind of go at their own pace until they receive their farm. Uh, some of them take it twice. And I mean, some people don't take it, but <laughs> it's a great resource. It's also a great way if you're getting some operators for your farm, um, some new operators and you want to get them trained, uh, they can work through that process just so that they can learn what they need to do in the farm as well. 
Um, and of course, we, we talked quite a lot about the, the farmer community, um, both with a, a lowercase c, and also this is our freight farms community with a capital C, if you will. We've, we have a platform that we've designed so that those farmers with their unique goals and stories can share those experiences. Uh, we know that it's you know, valuable to hear from us, but there's some things that you really want to hear from people who have been doing it, uh, like Demario. Um, and so we have a uh, farmhand community platform where you can kind of post questions, share your experiences, um, and you know, uh, celebrate your successes. Uh, on the right hand side here, you can see that there was a, a farmer that said, hey, we were thinking about growing microgreens. Um, has anybody done this? Uh, and somebody replied back and it's like, I've definitely done this. I have an older farm, but this is how I did it. Um, and it's, you know, you just learn from people who have been doing it for, for years. Um, we also have uh, round table events uh, that we host. I think Demario also mentioned one of those. Uh, we actually had one last night uh, where we had, I think 15 farmers that joined um, and we talked a little bit about crop management and some of the tools that, that Farmhand has to support that. Um, and I think there was, a, there was a pretty good mix of new farmers and also veteran farmers. Um, so it just really helps that, that communication happening uh, and make you feel not so alone in this really niche uh, um, you know, activity. Uh, so uh, really nice uh, support that's available there. Uh, and of course, we have opportunities for, for marketing collaborations. You know, you can talk to people like, um, like your account executive or some of our marketing folks like JC uh, about branding, about finding customers, about um, working with restaurants. Um, all of those resources are, are available to you. And I just wanted to add, as far as the roundtable events go, uh, they're, they're not just on uh, farming operations. We also host events that are more catered to like the optimizing your the business side of things for your farm. So um, one that I thought was really great was uh, focused on selling to restaurants. And we had one of our customers um, in Alabama, uh, who is actually a restaurant themselves, Vintage Hospitality, they uh, spoke about, you know, they had both perspectives of not only being a freight farmer, but also being a restaurant. Uh, so they were able to give our other customers tips and, and tricks on, on best practices for selling into restaurants. That's right. We, we also have a lot of things like pricing surveys where people say, you know, what are you selling your your bok choy at um, because sometimes you know farmers come in and they you know learn that they could be selling their their produce for hire um, just based on what other people have had success with so it's a great way of just you know checking in with others and figuring out and calibrating your own business a little bit um, and of course you know we have our our uh, support team uh, that's available to you um, as long as you have farmhand as long as you have uh, your farm online you know we can you know, check out your farm and see, you know, what's going on in terms of uh, your CO2 levels or your temperature of your farm and see, you know, if anything's going wrong, uh, we can see what needs to be adjusted and, and give you advice. Um, all of these analysis tools are available to you through Farmhand as well. Uh, but our team of experts kind of has that experience to look out for, you know, certain trends in the farm and, and see, oh, you know, uh, it's a good idea to uh, switch out your nutrients, flush your tank, uh, and, and, you know, just make those adjustments to get you on the track to success. Um, and of course, available by phone or, or email. Um, and, uh, you know, always willing to, to talk to you, right? Always happy to, to speak with farmers that, that want to improve. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, and thanks everyone for your patience while we uh, worked through those technical difficulties. Definitely have a lot of questions. So I'm going to rattle them off. Um, is farm camp training included with the freight farms purchase? If not, how much, um, how much does the, the in-person Boston farm camp training cost? Yep. Um, so it is not included uh, in the cost of the farm itself. Um, there are different prices for each. So the farm camp in Boston is twenty five hundred, which includes two seats, and um, it is just the two day uh, event. So it doesn't uh, include like travel. Um, but we do uh, do a hotel block and like discounted um, pricing for a hotel that's just about a block away. 
Uh, and then as far as the on-site launch and training for uh, domestic uh, in the US, it's uh, $10,000 uh, for two farms, for up to two farms. And then we can talk uh, like custom pricing if you're doing more than that. Great. I was like, what am I trying to remember to say? I am trying to remember to say that um, we are running a promotion and an attendee perk um, for folks who are registered for this digital discovery day. If you purchase between, um, if you attended this live and purchase between now and May 15th, we will actually waive the fee for our farm camp in Boston. So it's a, definitely a great deal to take advantage of and you can speak more to your account executive um, about it as well. Um, uh, Rachel, what is your estimated upfront cost for setting up um, a freight farms business? Like what, what should be, people be anticipating outside of just the MSRP? Um, so considerations would be training, like we mentioned, um, uh, shipping, which is four to 450 a mile uh, coming from Mansfield, uh, Massachusetts, and then also uh, supplies and uh, our, our farmhand software as well as your site preparations. Um, so depending on where you are in the world, uh, probably around like $160,000 to $170,000. Okay, good, good to know. Um, all right, are there any special considerations needed for placing these farms in more populated urban areas where maybe site security might be a concern? I can, I can take that. Um, I think that in general, you know, um, the concerns with uh, populated areas are usually around zoning, um, but with a shipping container, you have uh, the ability to, to lock it up. Um, and so it, they're, they're fairly secure. Um, also have the option, we have a lot of, uh, uh, of cameras in the farm. We have had some uh, farmers install cameras outside of the farms, um, but this hasn't really been a, a concern. Yeah, I find that, that this is weirdly hasn't been a concern. Like I haven't even heard about any graffiti incidences. Like we've had our farms in, in the city in like a very well-trafficked area. Um, sometimes I find if it's really good for the community, people might not vandalize it, which is great. But yeah, locked and secured. Um, okay. Um, if I purchased a farm, but there's a problem with my site preparation, can you hold shipping for a while? Um, yeah, that's, that's not usually a problem. It definitely has come up before. Um, we absolutely can. I think that there's two ways that we typically go about it. And it, one is if you let us know in advance, we can move you down in the ship with you. Uh, but if your farm is already completed and, and you don't find out until like kind of last minute, then yeah, there will be a storage uh, per month. I believe it's about like $200 or 150 So it's not, not too high, but. Um, okay. Thank you. I, Mark, are you having like slight? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Rachel, I don't know what's going on with your microphone. It's just cutting out in and out just a little bit, but I think um, everyone heard you. If it, there is, uh, we can hold it for a fee around like 200 ish dollars per month um, for every month that you need to push it after a certain amount. Um, can you paint the exterior with uh, your logo and colors? I can answer this one. Yes, absolutely. It's a 40 foot billboard. You should absolutely utilize the exterior of the farm. Um, and we have really creative examples of what our farmers have done um, with, with the outside. Um, but it's definitely not necessary, espe necessary, especially if you're not ne not in a high trafficked area. Um, if you e are in a high traffic area, definitely utilize it. And we can work with you. We have um, someone, uh, a vendor that handles all of like the vinyl wraps on the exterior of the farm. Okay, next question. This one's for you, Mark. Can a single person manage setting up um, and running a new farm by themselves? Um, I think the answer is yes for most tasks. Uh, there's a few uh, where you might want another person's help 
um, especially with things like leveling the farm um, or leveling the seedling table, um, or even installing the overhead fan, you might just want a, a, an extra pair of hands. Um, but, you know, uh, we typically have, uh, we have a, a timeline for all of those tasks. Um, and most tasks you, you can do a, as a single person. Um, some are a little bit time consuming, like installing all the wicking strips. Uh, but there's a, there's a plan for when you can start that process and it's well before you need them. Um, so I think, uh, just if you plan accordingly and just have an extra set of hands around for, for some of these tasks, uh, you'll be fine. Great. Two more quick questions. What is the warranty on the farm? The one year warranty. Okay. And then individual components have extended warranty, like, uh, the manufacturer's warranty, but you can talk to your account executive about that. Um, Mark, if someone chooses not to do on-site training when they first get their farm, but then decide later on that it would be helpful, is that possible to do? Um, or does it have to be at the first time uh, when someone's launching? No, uh, that's, that's definitely possible. We've had a lot of um, situations where that's occurred. Um, and we've also had farmers who have hired new operators that they want to, to have trained. Um, so that's always possible. Um, the academy is always available as well. Um, but uh, as you mentioned, Caroline, uh, it's always um, beneficial to get training early in that process if possible, uh, especially with this deal going on right now uh, where that, that cost can be waived. Um, but yes, it is, it is feasible. Okay. I totally lied. There are a couple more that I want to do really quickly. Um, how many hours, Mark, do you think it takes to, to unbox and set up the farm? Um, Again, I think that depends on how many pairs of hands that you have. Um, uh, we typically have tasks that uh, you can get started right away um, that can be done in the, the first few days where you get your farm. Um, and then there are tasks that you can be doing while you're waiting for your seedlings to, to germinate. Um, so we typically say that you can get your, uh, your first harvest within um, a month or so, um, but that's, uh, that's kind of your, your fastest estimate. Um, there are some tasks that you can do right away, as I, as I mentioned, and um, you can be doing in the background while you're waiting for your uh, other things to, to germinate or grow or transplant. Um, so there's a, there's a great structure to it so that it won't feel like a, too much of a burden. All right, truly last question um, for Rachel, which I hope I can hear. Uh, what is the, the payment schedule needed in order to get started? It is a 30% down deposit uh, due upon signing. Uh, and then 30 days later, the next deposit is due, which is 60%. And then last deposit, 10% due uh, prior to delivery. And um, it's, it's really blank on what I was gonna say. <laughs> All good. Um, amazing. That was- Remember, it is just for the farm itself. Um, so in that payment schedule, that's, that's just the farm or farms. Uh, the rest will be paid through farm hand uh, software. Great. Um, and someone's asking about the total cost of the farm as well. It's $149,000. Uh, and we are running a promotion until uh, the end of next month. So until March 31st, the farm is $145,000. 145 just in case anyone else's audio just cut out um so a couple different promotions running right now if you attend this live event and purchase before may 15th you can get free farm camp but also if you want to take advantage of the lower price of the farm between now and the end of march um you can do that as well so there are a few different ways that you can kind of cut down on your um, upfront costs which we definitely recommend so let's wrap up really quickly. Um, first of all, thank you all for spending, I think, how long? Two and a half hours with us. This is a jam-packed event, but we really hope that you got a lot of the information that you needed. We will be following up with a recording for uh, everyone in um, just a couple days. And 
What else was I going to say? We have a lot of different Digital Discovery Day interviews that you can listen to from our freight farmers. So if you're, um, it's it's basically Mario's session, but a few different versions. So if you want to hear from people who sell to restaurants or farmers markets or grocery or from a chef themselves, check check out that um, playlist that Amy just put in the chat. And I'm probably forgetting something, but I really hope that I'm not. Thank you all for uh, tuning in today. Um, and we'll talk to you all soon. We really hope you get started freight farming. <laughs>